Okay, our next speaker is Lars Kort. Kurt, uh, Kurt. Kurt um, talking about mixed license boss projects, uh, unintended consequences, worked examples, and best practices. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thanks for coming. I uh, hope this will be an interesting talk. Um, I'm going to cover topics such as how commonly, how common is it to projects are mixed license, license, some of the challenges around mixed managing mixed license projects, stuff people generally or contributors generally don't think about and their consequences. And I'm going to kind of put this in, make, make this a bit real. Uh, through some war st stories from the XM project, and then I'll conclude with uh, best practice at the end. A little bit about me. Um, uh, you see a few pictures there. I love to travel to weird places, so um, uh, and I'm trying to use some of my holiday snaps, you know, in the um, uh, <clears throat> in the presentation, and um, where it makes sense. I was a contributor to num numerous projects. Um, uh, I worked in a lot of different um, industry segments, uh, from parallel computing to tools to mobile and now virtualization. I'm essentially the community guy for the Xen project. I get paid by Citrix, but I'm essentially accountable to the community. And uh, I put this talk together because I led a number of different licensing-related activities last year um, uh, on behalf of the project, but also within Citrix. So to set the scene, I really wanted to sort of look at the question of how many open source projects which claim that a mixed, you know, single license are actually single license. Um, uh, <laughs> so, so let's just start out. You know, I just started out with a random number of projects um, which I tend to work with. Um, I did this for more of them, but you know, I, you know, we can do endless lists. So I just pick four. So you know, Linux says it's GPLv2. QMU says it's GPLv2. Xen, you know, we say we're GPLv2 too. You know, FreeBSD is BSD, and you know, you can make an endless list of those, right? So then I kind of ask myself, um, you know, what is actually the percentage of files? you know, which are in a, let's call it nat native license, you know, of that project. Um, uh, now, you may have seen, you know, like, like use the analogy, you know, a picture of sand. Um, the idea there is that, you know, like, you know, if you look at a heap of sand from afar, it looks very pure. And, uh, you know, if you look close up, it's less pure. And so there's a little bit of an idea of entropy, you know, going on there. And that sort of becomes a little bit of a theme throughout the uh, presentation. So let's look, look back at those four projects, right? So um, what I did there is um, I ran scan code, because that's easy and quick to run. run. It's not entirely accurate. It's not very accurate over the code bases of those four projects. And came up with an estimate of how much of it is actually the license it claims to be. Um, uh, the, I did put a, a, an upper bound in place, because there are lots of files in those projects which actually have no copyright headers at all. And you know the assumption there is that most of the time, that's the native license. But then there might be some directories which are entirely of a different license. So that means that's basically just an upper bound, an estimation. But what's interesting you know, is that actually a quite a significant proportion within those projects are actually of different licenses. And you know, I didn't just do this exercise um, for those four projects. I did this for a few more. And it kind of actually led me to believe um, that most projects or many projects, maybe even most, you know, of those who claim they're single license projects are, aren't in fact single license. And uh, then I wanted to look at some of the reasons. You know, why do projects you know, allow licenses other than the one they state uh, into, into their code base? So, so there might be lots of different reasons. You might want to interface you know, with another project of another license. So you know, if you're GPLv2 and your header files are GPLv2, obviously that's a project a problem. You know, if you want to use it in a, you know, in another project, 
um, you may want to allow other projects to interface with you. Um, so the same issue. Um, quite frequently, you may want to import code from other projects. And then coming back to this whole idea of entropy is you may not have clear rules that govern license except, except, uh, exceptions within your project. And if you don't have clear rules, that just means people assume that it's OK to add code with another compatible license to your project, which comes back to this whole idea of entropy. You know, if you don't have clear rules, then people will just add stuff, and you will get increasingly you know, mixed license over time. So the point is, all these you know, reasons are actually good and valid reasons for license exceptions. Right? There's no problem really with this. Um, the problem comes if you, don't, if you do that and you don't have any guidance, you don't have any best practice, and you don't have any tooling or you know, processes in place to really um, uh, enforce you know, a set of rules around what you want to achieve. And you know, if you don't have that, you may expose yourself to a number of unintended consequences. Um, and you know, some of them could potentially be quite significant. And that's where we get into the um, uh, war stories um, from, uh, from the Xen project. Um, so we'll look at a number of examples um, uh, where we tripped over this last year. Um, so there'll be three major storylines. Um, the first one will be around a major contributor fundamentally trying to um, uh, uh, looking at our code base to get you know, their employees' agreement to, co uh, to contribute to our project. So that's quite similar to the talk we had you know, beforehand um, around CLAs and some of the challenges vendors you know, face. And so there's an element of making this easier um, for projects. Um, we are going to look at um, a worked example of relicensing um, uh, a component and you know, how this kind of works in practice and kind of some of the challenges you might trip over and, and how maybe you can avoid that in the first place. And then uh, a really interesting one, which is around um, uh, GPL v2 or vx you know, only and uh, GPL v2 vx or later. Um, where there's quite a few, which is not very well understood generally uh, in the community. And I must admit, I didn't understand this very well either until I tripped over it. So, but before that, um, uh, what is the XEM project? Well, um, uh, we develop open source virtualization technology, and we've been around since 2003. Um, uh, we have a number of sub projects. The hypervisor, tool stacks, Mirage OS, drivers, and so on and so forth. So the stats I quoted earlier, they just relate to the um, hypervisor itself. And we're a Linux Foundation collaborative project uh, with a number of co big commercial backers behind it, um, which help you know, with infrastructure, blah, blah, blah. So what are our reasons you know, for license exceptions uh, in the code base? Now, in many ways, they're actually exactly the same ones as, um, as I listed earlier. They're just a little bit more specialized. So we want to enable um, guest operating systems. We, we want to enable uh, guest operating systems which aren't GPL, right? So we want to be able to run those operating systems on top of our hypervisor, and that means you know, we have to provide some kind of interfaces to do that. And we do that. Um, through making most of our public headers, you know, BSD or MIT licenses. We want to make it possible for such operating systems to have Xen support, to use them as control domain. Um, uh, and again, you know, some of the common code for that reason is BSD style, or some of it is dually licensed. Um, we also, you know, have a big ecosystem um, uh, around um, our code base. So we want to be able to have libraries, you know, um, being linked into third-party tools, um, uh, even proprietary ones. And um, uh, so some key licenses, we, we use LGPL for that reason. Oops. 
and we want to be able to import code from other projects, particularly you know, Linux and so on. There's some stuff we have to just import. Now, we didn't have any codified, you know, when this, um, uh, at the beginning of last year, we didn't have any codified rules around licensing exceptions. You know, there were some practices and how people in the community operated, but fundamentally, you know, we just assumed we were a single license project, right? And we were sort of totally oblivious to the fact that actually there's lots of other licenses in the code base. And the first storyline is really around the perils you know, of not having licensing information easily consumable by lawyers uh, who might look at your code base and who might make decisions about whether it's okay for their company, you know, to contribute to your project. So I don't want to name companies, so what I'm going to do there is for each company I'm going to use a code name and I'm using code names from uh, basically from Plant Life. So that what you see here is a dragon blood tree. Um, uh, and so, you know, in 2015 we had a large vendor, we called him Dragon Blood, who was reviewing the project with a view to allow their employees to contribute to our project. So, you know, this was around uh, October or so, 2015. Dragon Block Company, they put an IP lawyer, you know, onto our project. Um, and they started an IP and patent review. And the IP lawyer was very, very sorrow. Um, uh, so they evaluated license, looked at all the copying files, came across some inconsistencies, so they started running Phosology you know, on our code base. And then they started to you know, contact the Linux Foundation and then later me and started to ask lots of questions. Right? So they picked, a number, picked up a number of mismatches between what some of the copying files said and what was in some of the code, you know, in some of the code. These were all just relatively minor issues. So in one case, you know, the copying file said, well, you know, our, um, uh, you know, our public headers use um, BSD style um, uh, licenses and then a few files were MIT licensed, right? And then the lawyer picked this up, and then he wanted, you know, and, and, and then it started, you know, lots of questions started. They also picked up um, all these licensing exceptions through the Phosology review, and basically wanted to know, um, uh, um, you know, why we used another license, right? And then all these questions came to me. And while this whole process happened, um, they wouldn't allow their staff to contribute to our project. Right, they wanted to have all the answers first. I don't know how common this is, right? Whether this is an unusual case, um, uh, but that's what kind of happened, and that's what might happen to other projects too. So I ended up doing a lot of code archaeology to basically answer, you know, all of their questions um, to make sure that you know it's a big company such that it would contribute to the project because I didn't want them not to. Um, having them on board would have been an asset. So. I had to look at, you know, like, like, you know, I had a long list of questions, uh, and it typically fell into two classes of questions. You know, why was a specific, you know, component licensed in a specific way, and you know, um, what was the rationale, why a piece of code from elsewhere was imported, and where did it come from, and so on and so forth. And after, you know, after six months. Um, of you know, email exchanges between me and the lawyer, eventually they agreed their staff to contribute to the project. So first question is why did this take so long, right? Um, well, from my perspective, there was you know, all the information which was needed was actually there. Um, it was, just wasn't easily consumable, right? So you know, we 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 had you know like all the information when we imported code, you know, all this kind of stuff was there. But sometimes it was in commit logs, sometimes it was in header files, you know, um, uh, sometimes it was in another file somewhere in a tree, um, sometimes in a copying file, sometimes in what you know in an email, which some of these files referred to, right? So that took a very long time to actually pull together, and you know, as a lawyer. 
obviously, if you look at this, you're just going to look at this, oh, the information isn't there. They're not following good practice. That's not my problem. You know, they, you know have the community manager deal with this, right? Because there were some inconsistencies, um, basically, out that relationship and conversation with the lawyer basically started off the wrong foot as well. You know, um, uh, they came across things like where well, it said one thing, but the reality was other, so that didn't in immediately build trust either. And so I had to work quite hard to eventually build that trust um, by being responsive. And of course, you know, Lawyers tend to work on multiple projects. Um, so you know, every single time there was an email exchange, there'd be like two weeks of silence. And then you know, the whole process would take a long, very long elapsed time. So while this was going on, um, uh, basically our project decided that really you know, um, we must address this you know, for the future. We've, we're going through this once. We're actually doing all this. You know, or this archaeology right now, we may as well present the information in a way which makes it easier in the future for a lawyer just look to, to look at this, right, and, uh, and make some decisions. So this is what we do. did. It wasn't actually um, that much work in the code base to then basically fix that, um, because I had to dig out all the information in the first place to get that one contributor on board. So, we, we, we actually documented you know, our rules and conventions around license exceptions. And we added this you know, um, into the code base uh, in tree. Um, uh, so for example, now you know, each, comp each directory which isn't uh, GPL v2 basically has a copying file in it. Um, it explains you know, the rationale and some of the reasons why we're using a specific license. Um, you know, higher up we have uh, copying files which kind of explain, you know, the information architecture we're using, and um, uh, and some of the general guidance. But some of that is kind of described in a vague way. You know, we're we're basically, you know, we're, we're not saying, well, our public headers are um, BSD only. If maybe there's some other stuff in there, such that we don't get this kind of issue around. Uh, you know, where we say one thing, and then when you do it, dig into it, it's not quite accurate, which can build mistrust, right? Then, um, for every source file, you know, for every piece of code we import from somewhere else, we, you know, we basically have a readme.source file record. For, you know, smaller directories, we kind of have one file, and there we could just keep a record for every code import um, uh, we have from another project, um, and even for code which is also GPL v2. So if you import a code, you know, a file or a piece of code somewhere from Linux, we kind of rec record that in that file. And that file contains information such as, you know, why did we import it, where is it from, you know, and other meta information such that you can follow that up at some point in the future. And then we fixed some of the inconsistencies in, do in, in our documentation um, such that, you know, um, when a lawyer looks at it, um, uh, they can't point out, well, you say one thing, but actually that's not quite the truth. So, um, uh, so we fixed that. So that kind of was the first uh, story. Um, the second one is, um, uh, is basically ab about relicensing a key component um, within the project. So um, uh, there I'm going to look at you know, the general workflow and some of the challenges we find found around doing this. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, the uh, component in question, and you can then look that up, uh, is a patch series called Make the ACPI Builder Available to Components Other Than HVM Loader. That sounds pretty, you know, well, opaque if you want so, um, but actually behind, behind, you know, this is a major change which enables a major new piece of functionality. And actually all we wanted to do is we, we had to move, you know, a component around the stack somewhere else, but because of that we then had to make a license change. To kind of explain this, I want to talk, a, uh, introduce a bit of terminology and taxonomy such that that whole thing becomes a little bit clearer. Um, this is an orchid here, by the way, a rather weird one, um, uh, which I um, uh, found on 
in Costa Rica when I was traveling there. Um, but yeah, so so very brief introduction over our architecture, and then I'm re going to relate that to licensing. Um, so you know, at the bottom you have the hardware, then you have our hypervisor, um, deals with things like configuration, scheduling, memory, all those kind of things. Then we have you know a virtual machine, which we, the first virtual machine which is started up in the system is called DOM0 or VM0 that contains you know a kernel, Linux or BSD or some other operating system and that has drivers in it. Um, and then we obviously we have uh, guest VMs um, with a guest OS and applications, and they also have drivers in it which talk to the drivers in DOM0 and then talk to the hardware, and then the interesting and missing piece where, where the change is, is this thing called toolstack, which basically controls the entire system and has some third party, either console or graphical tool uh, on it, which talks to this. Um, and then the whole thing is sort of replicated across the board. And licensing terms, right? Um, uh, basically most of the hypervisor lower level stuff is, uh, is basically GPLv2. Um, most of our drivers are GPLv2 as well, but some of them are other licenses. For example, you know, Windows drivers obviously can't be GPL. Um, and then, you know, I was mentioning earlier some of our utility libraries like libxl and libxc, uh, they're LGPL. Um, so, and that's here, you see, the, if you, if you want to check that afterwards, you can um, uh, basically look at our slides in a bit more detail. So what does this mean for the ACPI builder change I was mentioning earlier? So basically just got to take everything out of this diagram, which isn't really relevant. And there we have you know, the HVR map loader, which is used by the hypervisor, and the ACPI builder is used by the HVM loader. And to make this change, we basically had to introduce uh, a new relationship where the LGPL code you know, had to use, you know, we wanted to be able to use it in the, the, the ACPI builder in LibXL. Now, what were our options at this you know, stage? Well, we could re-implement the ACPI loader uh, and make it you know, an integrated into the top library. Um, uh, but to do that, you know, we would have to really technically do a re clean room implementation and that would have been really hard and probably not really been doable because you know, the same people who wrote this stuff originally would have had to write the new thing in a, uh, again. Or we could just say, well, actually, we're just going to link that you know, GPLv2 library into that LGPL one, but then if you link the two together, then basically the whole thing becomes you know, GPL. And then you know, that would create some, um, uh, that would have been too disruptive for everybody who uses this library. Or you know, we could just relicense it. And that seems relatively straightforward. It wasn't that much code, you know, probably about 30 files or so. Now, probably about 30 contributors didn't really sound so bad. So we decided to relicense this thing um, uh, from GPLv2 to LGPL. So first, there's an observation that actually refactoring and ongoing development you know, might lead, might require unanticipated license changes if your project, you know, has multiple licenses. You know, if, if everything's the same license, obviously that's never going to happen. And maybe this could have been avoided with a bit more foresight and planning. So I guess you know, when, you, when you architect your system and really you know, introduce new components, maybe it makes sense to think a little bit forward about you know, where might this actually theoretically be used at some point in the future and then choose the license accordingly. Um, Probably in, ca in our case, so that wouldn't maybe, you know, like that component was introduced more than 10 years ago, you know. <laughs> um, we probably, you know, at that time wouldn't have really anticipated, we, you know, that we may need to be able to use that thing further up the stack. So let's look at the workflow of relicensing a component. So the first step is really identifying all the copyright holders. And you know, how, how do you do that? Um, well, 
um, you, you're going to look at the copyright header for, headers of your files. You're going to look at the Git logs, you know, at the authors. Um, if you have a DCO or something similar, um, you're going to look at all the uh, sign-off tags. And you may also have to look at the code import history and then just you know, piece the logs from different projects together So if, you know, <clears throat> to make sure you really get all the copyright holders. In our case, we did all of this, but then it turned out you know, that the list of names was the same as just the ones as came from the DCO. Um, which is what we would have expected um, in the first place, which is a good thing. So then you get the list of copyright holders. And typically, what I did is I kind of then you know, divided that list up into individuals who own the copyright and companies, because to get the approval, um, uh, um, you would, you, know, you, would, you would handle this differently for individuals than for companies. And I'll get to this a little bit later. So identifying copyright holders is really easy, right? <laughs> well, maybe not. Um, so you could trip over tooling issues. So you know, our repository, we first used Mercurial. Um, and then we con converted the, the entire tree to Git at some point, you know, like six or seven years ago. Um, and Mercurial doesn't do code motions very well. Um, so you know, when you track the history and then you convert it, you know, like when you move files around, your history kind of sort of stops, right? So we had to then manually stitch this together. The same can also happen in Git you know, if, you do, if, if you do your code motions wrong. So there's some technical issues which you could trip over where you have to be careful about. Another thing is, well, actually, was the code you, know, you want to relicense or some of it imported from elsewhere, right? Um, now, if you keep got good records, um, uh, you, may, um, uh, you, you, know, you may have all that data and may be able to stitch that all together. But probably it's safest to run some phosology or another tool over it and then basically kind of establish an entire chain of uh, where that code came from. Now, if yes, you know, if it was imported from elsewhere, then obviously your, your list of contributors and the list of people who you might get, you need to get approval from um, grows and gets bigger. Uh, in our case, the code was originally imported from Linux, um, and we nearly missed that. Um, there also could potentially be issues with CLAs. Um, uh, you know, if some of the code you imported has a CLA, then obviously you may have to ask some other people, uh, like a foundation, to get approval as well. Another thing which was interesting was we had some issues around the use of private email addresses by company employees, and uh, you know, and so we, so even so, we knew that some people during that time, um, uh, you know, had worked for a company. They used a private email address. So we had to ask them privately and the company because we didn't know whether the change was made on company time or not, right? So probably you want to have a policy around that within your project as well, um, just in case you, know, you have to read license a component at some point. So back at the workflow, right? So um, uh, what did we do then? The individuals, we contacted them all by emails. Um, for the company contributions, um, uh, basically I tried to find reps in that company to make a decision on behalf of the entire company. That was quite easy for us because most the companies who um, uh, contribute on our, pro on our project are basically actively engaging with it through our advisory board. So I could do this relatively easy. Other projects might find that quite difficult. Um, and then there was a lot of chasing. Um, uh, because individual email addresses might change, you know, people change jobs and so on. So I had to sometimes you know, go via LinkedIn and track people down and so on and so forth. Now, um, companies can be a bit of a problem um, if, if you lose a relationship with them. How do you get you know, approval from somebody where a team which originally you know, introduced a change, how do you get, you know, if that team doesn't exist anymore and maybe hasn't existed anymore for like seven or eight years. Um, anyway, so if you get the approval, right, then you can do the commit, um, you, you know, keep records and everything, and if not, you need to work, find a workaround. Well, 
In our case, this is a picture of an orchid, a dendrobium, so we have another code name come up. Um, we had a contributor, let's call him XYZ, who worked for that vendor called Dendrobium, and we couldn't track him down, and we couldn't get his approval. He did this under a corporate address, but you know, first we thought, well, let's find out you know, whether that guy um, uh, um, basically still works for that company. Um, that failed because, you know, like uh, the person was working, was, was based in China, LinkedIn doesn't work in China, you know, and we just couldn't track that person down. But fortunately, we had a lot of Chinese companies we work with, so they asked around. So eventually we managed to track down that person. But that didn't really help us because basically then it turned out the team didn't exist anymore. You know, um, none of the people who originally worked on that stuff worked for that company anymore. And, uh, you know, so, we, so that didn't actually lead us anywhere. Um, then, we, then I sort of started thinking, well, actually, maybe I can search for some other open source contributions from the company to other projects and then, you know, get to somebody who cares about open source in that company. Well, as it turned out, there, was no, you know, there were no recent contributions from that company to any project. Um, and then I just started searching for, you know, on LinkedIn generally for, you know, open source staff and CTO office staff and so on and so forth. And eventually I got a hit and they got back to me. But at that point, we kind of thought probably this is going to lead any, to anywhere, you know. Um, uh, we're never going to get approval from the company. Let's look at a backup plan. But luckily we did get that approval. It just took some time until they basically decided what to do with that contribution. And that was around... 15 lines of code, really, right? <laughs> um, uh, so we made a contingency plan. Um, and we used the fact that binaries and not source code are licensed, right? So we took the ACPI loader code base and built two variants of it from it. Um, one which had, you know, which was used in a lower level where we needed everything, which was, you know, GPL. And the other variant um, would just, you know, use part of it and uh, was LGPL. Um, we were, initially, we were looking at, well, can we just, you know, take that code sort of out? But that was just too, that would have been too complicated uh, to do because it happened so, so far in the past. So we built, it, built these two variants and we made sure that, you know, all the GPLv2 code was clearly separated such that we could maintain that going, in, going forward in the future. But actually, this would have been really ugly, not easily, not easily maintainable, and so on and so forth. So, um, so we were really lucky that we could actually track down um, uh, um, that company, got the approval, and didn't actually have to go for the workaround. So what were our work to pain points around this whole process? Well, tooling, right? So you have to be really careful you know, around particularly code motions. You know, if you don't do this right, then you might lose part of your history. Um, documentation, we also tripped over the fact that we didn't have a record for some code imports from Linux in this readme.source file pattern. Um, and we nearly missed that dependency, right? Which would have meant we would have possibly missed some copyright holders whose approvals we needed. Um, uh, this wasn't so much an issue um, uh, with, uh, with this particular relicensing, but I've had other ones where this has come up a lot, is uh, sign-offs on company times or, you know, like where people use private email addresses. So you probably want to have a policy around this in particular, if your project allows alias, you know, like many projects, it's like the Linux kernel gives contributors kernel.org aliases. We, do, we have the same. We have a xenproject.org alias. Well, actually, what does it mean if somebody signs, you know, um, with that alias, right? Is that a personal contribution? Is it a company contribution? And so on and so forth. And then, you know, the whole process around getting the approval. That was rather painful. Um, as well. Um, so, you know, there we implemented a backup, but ultimately it wasn't needed. That leads me to the third story, which is all around unintended consequences of mixing 
well, I'm not going to read this out. I'm just going to talk about GPL and you know, use it as an, a synonym for GPL or NLGPL. Version X only, you know, which means that you take the license and you remove the um, uh, uh, and or later in brackets and specify a specific license. And you know, the variant of the GPL where you leave this in. So you remember the dragon blood, blood tree um, uh, and that company? Um, well, part of that whole approval process meant, you know, besides the license review, they did a patent review as well. And the company was rather sensitive towards patents and GPL v3. And basically they said, well, if you have any GPL v3 code in your code base, we're not going to contribute to you full stop. But then they discovered that we had a number of files which were marked GPL v2 or later. Um, in a project, um, and then because you can take those files and copy it into another GPL v3 project, um, they basically said, well, that may mean that we can't actually contribute to your project, right? And I didn't really understand this very well. You know, this was something which was relatively new to me. Um, and I was really surprised that we had, you know, files like this in the code base as well. So I kind of was asking, why did we actually have GPL v2 plus, you know, or GPL v2 or later code in our code base? Was it a conscious decision? You know, how much is there? And actually, it turned out that this was purely accidental because people would just go to the FSF website, right, and copy the license template, and that license set template says GPL v2 in brackets or later, right, and then I copy that into the code base. And you know, we had no mechanism in place to really prevent that or look at it. You know, it was just something which happened. And actually, um, then I asked myself, is this specific to us, right? Do other projects also trip over this? And you know, those four projects I listed earlier, um, they all have um, GPL v2 code. So I was asking the question, how much GPL v2 or later code do they have? So how, what is the proportion of their GPL v2 code, which is actually marked GPL v2 or later? And you know, Linux 14%, QME 9%, XM Project 10 you know, FreeBSD 32 So that really implies that there's actually, you know, there's not a lot of knowledge around that and not a lot of um, what this might actually mean, right? So what did we do? So the first question is, can we actually go and fix this, right? So um, so I looked at this, and it didn't really seem to be a precedent, and it wasn't really um, uh, a lot of clear guidance on how you would deal with you know, changing these licenses. Do, would you have to go through a full process and ask everyone for approval? Um, so I started to talk to lawyers about this. But at the same time, we also started to, I started to talk to key community com members, and actually it became clear that this was potentially a very divisive issue, so I didn't want to go there. So um, then we thought about this and basically you thought, well, we have this problem right now. Let's just not make it worse, right? Um, uh, so the first thing we did is we added templates. License header templates, which don't have the or later in it um, uh, for all our GPL and LGPL code. Um, we raised awareness amongst committers and maintainers to make sure that they picked this up. Um, and then ultimately, in this particular case, the issue went away because you know, I did some of this research and could point out to the lawyers that actually, by the way, some of those projects you already contribute to and you've given you know, your, your engineers approval to contribute, they have exactly the same issues as, as we. Why do you treat us differently than those other projects? So the issue went away, but obviously um, it, means, it may mean you know, that that company has instructed their staff maybe not to contribute to files which are labeled GPL v2 plus. We don't know. Or there might be other companies who've been through this process and haven't talked to us who just looked at our code base and decided not to contribute for that reason, right? So fundamentally, there's a slightly bigger issue b hidden behind there, right? Um, around this uh, GPL v x only um, or later issue. So, Basically, you know, if you're, uh, this is our case, right? Um, uh, 
if you're a version two only project and you allow version two or later um, files, well, you could scare away some contributors. Um, if you're a LGPL v2 or later project and you allow you know, files which are specific to a specific version in your code base, well, you're actually then uh, diminishing your capability to upgrade your code base to a new version at some later point in the future. Um, so really what this means, if you do the one or other, you should have mechanisms in place to enforce that your code base stays pure because otherwise you end up with the boast, you know, with the worst of both worlds. You may be able to not, you may not be able to upgrade, and you may, you know, scare away. Yeah, I know. I only have two slides left, so I'm fine. <laughs> so basically, you may end up with the boast of, you know, worst of both worlds. And if you look at all those big projects beforehand, that's the de facto situation we are in right now. Um, so I just wanted to summarize um, some of the key best practices and lessons we learned is really if you want to stay single license, a single license project, you need some tooling or some processes to actually enforce that. Because if you don't, um, really what happens is um, you know, the law of entropy comes in and by default you become mixed license. The same is true you know, if you're basically a L or a GPL VX only or, uh, or later project, you probably want to have some tooling in place or some mechanisms in place to avoid a mixture of those two. Um, if you are, a, you know, if you do use multiple licenses, you probably want to document license exceptions. In particular, you know, the rules around it, your conventions, you know, rationale for license exceptions, for particular instances, you probably also want to provide copyright templates for the common licenses you use. You probably want to have some mechanism to, um, uh, to record imports um, uh, from other code bases in a consistent manner, and that for all imports into your code base. And you probably want to have some conventions around uh, you know, what does it mean if somebody, you know, like around company and personal sign-off, um, uh, particularly if you use a DCO. I mean, uh, the same issue was kind of raised in the previous talk around um, uh, uh, contributor agreements. And basically, DCOs kind of have the same issue uh, in many ways, but that usually isn't very well documented uh, anywhere by any of those projects which use DCOs. And you know, a plan for the future. If you introduce new, component, new components, think about it with, a, with a licensing spectacles on and what somebody might want to do um, uh, in the future and then, you know, adapt maybe the license accordingly such that you don't have to relicense it and go through this pain at some later stage. And that's it, so I'm, uh, I'm open to take some questions. Is somebody maybe going to, yeah, we'll, we'll start there. Does somebody have a microphone? Yeah. So, so my question was, I saw that you were recording it, but you're recording it in a readme.source that's like markdown kind of file? No, nah, it's just a text file, right? Um, I mean, we could use something more sophisticated, right? But, yeah, yeah um, so my question is, why didn't you use SPDX? Because I actually have to look at your project now, and it was neat that it was written down, Yeah. but we have I can't S machine read it. Well, SPDX tells you, you know, you, you can make an, it doesn't allow you, does it allow you easily to record where the license has come from? If you imported code? Yes, you yes. can add a license comment to it. So it's easily right. there. I mean, that, so the reason is I, I actually wanted to use SPDX, right? But there's some, some of the key people in the project have issues with SPDX for whatever reason, so I couldn't actually get that through, unfortunately. So, so right? we should talk and figure out what those issues are so yeah. we can fix it. Yeah, I, actually I might get you in touch with the guy who's particularly objecting <laughs> <laughs> SPDX. Yeah, there was one further down. Uh, what did 
Thanks. Uh, what if the company that uh, hold uh, that uh, 15 line code base had closed down? Uh, is that a problem or that's better? Well, we get, did get the approval in the end, right? Um, uh, but if we hadn't got that impro a a approval, we basically would have, it would have technically been um, uh, a problem because, you know, 15 lines um, are still IP, right? Um, and we couldn't. No, the company actually existed, so we managed to track them down. I have no idea. That's a that's an interesting question, um, right? I mean, typically you have maybe a company who buys them, then you can find somebody. But if somebody, maybe you have to find the individuals who worked on that. I'm not a lawyer, so that would be a question for one of the lawyers in a room. What do you do in that case, right? I don't know. A question up there. Maybe one more. One more, and that's it. Yeah. I think I got a yellow T-shirt. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. So find me afterwards. Uh, thank you for joining the talk and uh, giving me the time to talk to you.